I am David Crosby of Virginia State University. I want to welcome everybody that has logged in today. This is the fourth of, of the series of uh, aquaculture for homesteading, rural and urban. Today we're going to I'm assuming David may have. Yeah, bandwidth issue. There he is. He's back. Okay, we lost my, him. We lost. Oh, shoot. How long I've been talking for five minutes. <laughs> Worked out. It was perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I'm David Crosby with Virginia State University. And today I want to welcome everybody to the uh, fourth in the series of uh, aquaculture for homesteading, rural and urban. Uh, we're gonna have three presentations today. One, we're gonna be talking about how we can use our homesteading farm pond as a way to generate some income. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to uh, process our fish that we have in our cages, ponds, or in our aquaponic or rest systems for our own use so we can feed our families, cut down some cost, and have a healthy meal. And thirdly, we're going to talk about how we can possibly go do some marketing of our products that we are growing in our ponds, cages, aquaponic, hydroponic systems at many farmers markets. Uh, the first, first one that's going to be presented is going to be presented by Brian uh, Neary, who's down at Virginia State University. Uh, the second one is going to be uh, Abigail Valaba, but I'm going to be doing the presentation, and that presentation is going to cover how to prepare your product for storage, long-term storage. And uh, Jonathan Vasenton is going to talk about marketing. So Brian, I'm going to let you uh, uh, take over and talk about uh, fee fishing. Well, th thank you, David, and, and welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about fee fishing, and, and if we go to the next slide, I'll just say next, and Mark will uh, move. So fee fishing is basically uh, for individuals to, to pay for the right to fish in a private pond. Uh, and it, 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 it is the ideal uh, way for an individual to uh, move some product in that it provides both recreation, plus they're able to uh, move the uh, fish, in this case, directly to the consumer. Uh, and certainly fishing is, is the fee fishing provides an opportunity for the, a family to have outdoor recreation. Uh, and, and it works out for conservation in Virginia in that the uh, permit payments or the cost of the permit goes toward uh, improving the uh, environment. Um, it's, it's used by their, uh, in this case, the Virginia uh, uh, Wildlife Resources um, Department, which is the new name of the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, to do some, uh, in, uh, it's, it, it is their income revenue. Uh, certainly getting out to do Fishing is healthy. Uh, it reduces stress, even though people who don't catch fish claim that it's, it's the worst thing possible. Uh, but when you are successful, uh, that uh, eight inch fish becomes a, a 12 inch one. So it works out. Uh, it provides you an opportunity to uh, enhance your, your ego or whatever. But from a fish fishing operator, uh, if you're looking at it from a business, it works out well in that you can have some control over your operation. Uh, you will dictate when it can be, when you are open, when people will be at your ponds. Uh, you're bringing the market to your fish rather than have to transport the fish to the market. There is no processing involved in it. Uh, and you certainly don't have to rely on someone else to, to sell your product. Next. 
and as is always the case, there's a permit requirement. And the permit uh, to run a fee fishing operation does exist, and it's on the web page. It's on the the website is is on the bottom of the page, uh, and this basically allows you to run either a, a cold water or warm water operation. In addition to it, on the next page, you'll see that that uh, uh, there are the time period for that permit runs from uh, October 1 until September of the next year. Uh, and depending on the type of permit dictates on whether people who fish at your operation uh, have to have a permit to fish there. Uh, so there's, it, so it varies from operation to operation. Next slide. So what are people using on for encouraging people to participate. And certainly one of them that is most widely used is cold water trout. Uh, and it, it varies from, and I, this, these pictures here are an operation in Chesterfield County that I selected basically because it is a year round operation. Uh, it's a cold water spring because the trout require temperatures in the 60 degree Fahrenheit range. And uh, uh, they're able to uh, have a, a people come in on the 4th of July to catch rainbow trout. And on the right is his daughter with a uh, about a three pound rainbow trout that was harvested. Uh, now these, these, there's a small pond and this works out well because you don't have to have a massive pond for a fee fishing operation. And you don't even have to have a pond. Uh, there are some examples of trout operations that have uh, uh, streams that have been on a private property where the operator will create zones of fishing, uh, different rock formations in a stream that people can fly fish. And this is primarily in the western part of the state out near Abington, uh, where you do have uh, a catch and release in that people pay for the opportunity to fish. Uh, and then once they catch the fish, they will release it back into the, to the same environment. Uh, we have other operations, uh, such as one that was called, it's closed down now, called Trophy Trout, which was west of Fredericksburg. And uh, it was an old milk farm where they had a farm pond that was stocked with trophy size, five pound rainbow trout. Uh, individuals from Washington DC and some of the uh, individuals who typically would fly out to catch large trout in the Western states could drive down for a morning activity in, in uh, a, a pond in, in near Fredericksburg to catch the large fish, uh, have their picture taken with a, a large trout, and then in the afternoon they can drive back to Washington, Washington DC for a meeting. Next slide. Uh, and they also have your, your, probably the number one fish that is fished out in, in some areas is channel catfish. Uh, the picture on the right is an operation in uh, 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 the far western part of the state uh, off of 81, uh, small ponds, uh, and you notice it's multiple ponds because frequently fish don't eat at uh, all the time and so you have to have a backup system where you could have large fish in one for fishing and the other one is where the, the fish are being conditioned for the following weeks fishing op opportunities. Next slide. Uh, there's also your bass and bluegill populations, just regular farm ponds with people enjoy fishing for those. Next slide. But in Virginia, there's a demand for a uh, hybrid striped bass or striped bass rockfish, uh, which is controlled by the Virginia uh, Marine Resource Commission. Uh, and these are operations that that uh, have uh, uh, an interesting demand. Uh, on the eastern sh shore, there are operations that, uh, fee fishing operations where uh, fishing clubs will come in 
uh, and they will fish a pond with, with hybrid striped bass and they will fish until everyone around the pond has a fish on their line. So it's a, it, they've turned it into a game. And these are the types of opportunities that exist for marketing your operation uh, to enhance people to participate. Next slide. And as always is the case, when you do have a uh, people involved, there's liability uh, issues. You probably need to have some, tor some type of blanket uh, coverage, uh, which is reasonably priced. Uh, and, and in doing so, you need to monitor the people who are participating. Your client behavior, obviously alcoholic beverages probably should be prohibited. Uh, you would, if you have aeration equipment in your pond, you need to make sure that's not in the fishing area and certainly have uh, uh, first aid kits and life-saving uh, devices, uh, not only available, but visible. And you don't want to have people fishing at the same time as, or swimming as at the same time as they're fishing. Next slide. So if, as an overview, the key factor in, in fee fish is your is your location. Uh, you'd like to have uh, a location that's relatively close to an urban area so you have a, a good client base. You'd like to have reliable suppliers of, of, of your products, of your, of your inputs. Uh, you'd like to have at least two ponds so that you can assure that there'll be fish available when people are fishing. Uh, how do you make money? There's an, usually an entrance fee or there might be sales by the pound or by the unit. Some people have a five gallon bucket and you pay by, fill up the bucket and pay a certain amount for that. But you can set your own uh, charges. Next slide. So as I said, location's most important. Uh, typically you would like to have it in an area where there's not a lot of fishing, other fishing opportunities. And also, if you're successful, you'd like to look at, is your, does your site provide you an opportunity for expansion? Is the soil good? Do you have a good water supply? Not just a good supply, but is the quality of the water good? You don't want to have runoff from uh, contaminated areas. Uh, and certainly you can enhance the fishing depending on the type of, of product you have. You can put structure in there so that there's a place for fish to hang out. Next slide. So where do you get your, your product? Uh, certainly you'd like to have a reputable source. Uh, and the picture on the right is a local catfish farmer who's able to supply uh, stocking si or, or harvestable size fish for operations. Uh, there are uh, uh, individuals who will truck larger fish in from other states uh, that are reputable. Uh, and you certainly don't want to harvest fish from uh, or catch fish from some other source and bring them into your pond because you could bring in diseases or, or possibly put the wrong fish in there. Uh, next slide. So uh, who manages these types? What type of qualities do we like to see? And one of them is you'd like to have a people person because you have to deal with a cross section of from families to individuals who are, are, are just cantankerous. Uh, you'd like to have some sort of handicap access zone so people could come in uh, and it's easy for them to uh, uh, relax and enjoy the fishing experience. Uh, you, entrances and exits from these operations should be as restricted so you can make uh, uh, observe people as they come in and you can collect the appropriate fees. Uh, you'd like to have uh, ample parking away from the ponds. Probably you would have, in, in some cases, on a larger operation, you would have some sort of retail sales or, or where you could sell bait, you could sell soft drinks uh, or, or ever, however you'd like to expand it. Uh, and you certainly would like to have the rules of how people should behave posted there so that there's, there's some indication of how, of how people should act. Uh, certainly you can have cooking areas, trash can be a problem, but provide uh, an, um, an abundant supply of trash receptacles. 
You don't want uh, people to have live bait that could cause some contamination. And restrooms are important also. Next slide. So revenue, uh, certainly you need to have a business plan. You need to be clean. You need to have a, a, a good supply of, of feed and storage for it. Certainly water management uh, capabilities. Uh, and you'd like to be able to promote it. Depending on how busy you'd like to be, word of mouth seems to work out well for many places, but certainly you can promote it uh, for certain times of the year. Uh, every operation in the state is so different. There's no real guidelines, but certainly tourism is certainly something that the, the state enhances and fee fishing is one that could fit in well with that. Uh, and certainly it's a desirable character, desirable activity. It's peaceful and, and can be non-crowded. Next slide. So the objective here is you'd like to have repeat customers. You'd like to have the, a good experience uh, and you'd like to have uh, a success because it's not just fishing that's successful, it's the overall experience. Next slide. So everyone can get out there and enjoy the fee fishing experience. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just to add a note here, if you go into retail places right now, like Bass Pro and all that, the fishing gear has been worked over. There's a very minimal amount of fishing gear available right now because everybody seems to be headed towards the, to the lakes, ponds, and fishing uh, as an activity that's was developed during our COVID-19 as a way of getting outside or trying to relieve the uh, mental anguish of having to stay inside. So uh, fishing gear has been uh, really going out the door in many of these places. And you may be having issues to find your favorite lure now at these stores. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Okay, the, I guess we'll go ahead and move into our next presentation. Uh, it's going to be about processing and packaging your catch for your consumption. In other words, you're going to be taking fish out of your ponds, out of cages, out of your tanks, and what you're going to do with them. And, and usually uh, this presentation is given by the Seafood Lab by Abigail uh, Vallabon. Uh, as the food uh, specialist, food safety specialist down there. Uh, so we're going to be talking about how to process our fish, how to keep it safe, uh, because one thing we don't want to do is, is have smelly fish uh, in our refrigerator and in our freezer and end up trying to eat it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, if you go be processing fish for uh, sales and all that, you go probably need to have a, a license to do this. Uh, you know, that's one thing that you might have to look at. Uh, but if you're planning to do this for your own consumption, uh, you're not going to need anything uh, license wise to do that. But you do want to. Uh, look at some of the presentations that we did in previous sessions on uh, back on July 8th, 28th, when we did a whole series on uh, marketing fish uh, to uh, farmers market that talked more about how to sell that uh, to the uh, public in that farmers markets. Next slide. Okay. Uh, Pretty simple uh, thoughts and procedures that you need when you're thinking about doing this for yourself. Uh, most important thing is with any meat products or any uh, fish products or anything that you're processing, you need to keep it cold. Uh, this prevents bacterial growth, uh, which is very critical because you don't need to have uh, excess bacteria growing on your a product, you don't want to end up with some kind of salmonella, listeria problems, or anything like that. So the next thing is, 
keep everything clean, you know, sanitize everything, you know, wash your hands, wash the area, sanitize uh, your particular area, you know, you know, remember the, the rules of keeping things clean, uh, soapy water, rinse, sanitize, you know, three bowls to keep yourself clean. Uh, keep everything separate. Don't mix up poultry from your chicken houses with your fish. That's one thing that you don't want to do is uh, keep your products separated. And, and lastly, when you get ready to, to cook it, make sure you cook it properly. Make sure you get it at the right temperature. Next slide. Okay. The first thing you want to do is uh, humanely kill your fish as quickly as you can. And one of the humane ways of killing a fish that's in the books is take a, a fish thumper and, 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 and hit the cranium very sharply. This will quickly kill the fish and uh, do that. Other ways to do this to kill fish mainly, especially warm water fish, is to uh, uh, use ice to chill them down until they succumb to uh, that temperature. But you want to make sure you have ice, keep it cold, keep it in the refrigerator. You don't want to have your fish sitting out for several hours and trying to process it. So process your fish very quickly once you take it in and kill it. Next slide. Okay, so again, uh, wherever you process, keep it clean. You know, uh, fish has guts and they get everywhere, especially when you start gutting the fish, clean the guts, have a place to uh, remove the guts into, some kind of bucket that you can put it in uh, so you can keep your table area clean and everything else. Have a place to, if you're cutting the heads off, some place to put the heads. So keep all your equipment clean, clean off. And uh, again, you know, you're working with a knife, uh, make sure it's sharp, because uh, that's gonna be what's uh, gonna be very uh, instrumental in uh, processing your fish. If you're using a dull knife, you're not gonna be able to do it very good. Um, again, uh, sanitize, you know, um, Bleach works very well as a sanitizer, and there's other sanitizers out there that you can get. Next slide. Okay. Again, we were talking about keeping things separate, right? You know, keep your fish separate, you know, keep your gut separate, heads separate. Uh, if you got your flying your fish, have a place to put your fillets. And when you're doing it, um, like taking your fillets and you're separating them off for your fish, put it on ice, get it chilled down. That's very uh, critical. Next slide. Okay. Okay. Now we want to, we got our fish cleaned. Uh, we got our uh, fish processed and a point that we want to start packaging it. One of the things, you know, we want to do, you know, we say we did rainbow trout. You cut the heads off and you scraped out the guts and everything else. You want to rinse it off. So, so rinse your fish off before you packaging. Make sure you get all the guts and stuff out of the system before you start doing it. Uh, you can wrap it in plastic. And once you do that, you probably want to continue wrapping that fish with some aluminum foil to, in order to really uh, protect that product. Uh, most important thing, which tends to forget, people forget a lot of times, is uh, they don't put a label on it. Uh, I like to, you know, use uh, Ziploc bags to put things in. So label everything, the date on that. I don't want to pull out a, a mystery package thinking that you got chicken or or something else and it turns out to be hamburger not a fish so uh, then you have to change your menu for that particular night again when you put them in the refrigerator try to store it in the coldest place uh, and if you're storing it for more than a couple of days uh, you 
you may want to think about freezing it if you think you got to store it for more than two or three days. So if you put it in the refrigerator, make sure that you use that fish within a couple of days. Don't let it sit there for a week and take it out. Uh, it might not be the most palatable fish ever. Next slide. Okay. Uh, if, okay, if you're not going to keep it in the refrigerator, what's the next best thing to do? Is put it in your freezer and store it in the freezer. Fish properly stored in the freezer can last up to 12 months. That's a pretty long shelf life for for a, a freezing uh, package in a, in a freezer for use. So what you want to do is... Dr. Crosby, we lost you. you. Mark, why don't you go on to the next one? So I guess vacuum packing, I guess, is the next slide, which deals with... You know, Hello. David comes, yeah, go ahead, Hello. David. Hello. <laughs> Back up, please. Somebody, somebody jumped in on me. Next slide, okay. Uh, what you want to do is put it in some type of bags. And the main thing is don't bunch the fish up in a little ball or anything like that. Make sure you got it flat and make sure you have plenty of air space around it. So when you put it in the freezer, make sure there's enough cold air to be able to circle, circulate around that product to bring it down quickly because it's going to freeze from outside in and the quicker you get the middle frozen the better off you're going to be uh, again uh, if you want to defrost the fish once it's been frozen you know it's been sitting in there six to twelve months you take it out put it in your refrigerator it may take you a day and a half to two days before it's thawed out but once it's thawed out cook it next slide Next slide. Uh, the next slide is uh, vacuum packing. This is what everybody's doing now. Oh, back, back up. Uh, vacuum packing fish is, is the way to go. If I was going to have fish put in my freezer, vacuum packing it works nice. It keeps it to single servings. It allows you to see what you have. Uh, and the product will last much longer in a vacuum pack versus a regular uh, wrapping it in, in plastic wrap and foil and put it in a bag and put it in the freezer. Again, you would treat it just like a frozen product as we said in the previous slide. Make sure you take it out, uh, put it in the refrigerator. Another thing, make sure nothing's gonna contaminate that product while it's in the refrigerator. Let it fall out on the refrigeration and don't set it out on the table uh, and let it sit there all day long, don't fall. Next slide. Okay. Now, the most important thing is, remember, we gotta keep it cold. Now we gotta keep it hot. We gotta get it cooked to a proper level. Generally, fish can be cooked at uh, 145 degrees, which is a good zone for cooking fish, for on the pan and all that. Uh, of course, if you cook it in frying oil, your temperature is much higher in oil. Again, as far as I know, fry fish kills everything. And, you know, that's my opinion. So fry fish takes care of a lot of things. But if you're going to have a stuffed product, like you take a catfish or a flounder, you try to put some crab meat or something like that in there, make a sup product, you want to cook it at a higher temperature to make sure everything's getting cooked properly make sure the stuffing material is reaches a sufficient temperature. It also helps to have a thermometer. Get those instant read thermometers to measure things, you know. Uh, those things are readily available. They're cheap. Ten bucks to get you a, a look, uh, a uh, digital thermometer that tells you what the uh, temperature of the, the uh, food is instantaneously so you know what's going on. Uh, you know, Again, uh, next slide, please.
Okay. Okay. Uh, if you're looking for more information out there, there's plenty of information available out there uh, on the extension publication world. Uh, there's some good uh, publications out of uh, uh, Sea Grant from Delaware by Doris Hicks. Uh, so there's plenty of publications available. Uh, cookbooks, plenty of cookbooks that tell you how to properly uh, prepare f uh, fish and how to bring it up to the right temperature. So again, just recap here, you know, kill it, ice it, dress it out, process it, freeze it, or refrigerator two or three days, make sure you do everything on a clean basis, make sure everything's cleaned up and everything's not contaminated. And that should do it. You know, the main thing is um, keep things cold, keep things hot. Next slide. Okay. And in the end, we have a low country boil from the looks of it. Uh, so, you know, we have a feast from our cages from our ponds or from our aquaponic system. So the most important things is, is to make sure that you follow the proper steps of taking care of the fish uh, so you can have a safe storage of it so you can have a great meal later on in different times of the year. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, okay. The previous okay. presentations, is there a link I can go watch and hear them? Uh, yeah, and you can also get, we'll also have you the files. We are working on those uh, previous presentations to get them closed captioned and get them edited, and then we will have the links available. Um, so we'll get those out to everybody. Um, as far as I know, is that correct, Mark? Yeah. And Doc, okay. That's what yeah. I thought. Okay, we and will, there's enough. Go ahead. Yeah, we will have these uh, available on the YouTube channel. We're slowly getting them up. We have several that's already been from previous uh, presentations up. So it takes a little time for the stuff to come up. But if you're looking for a I, uh, wanting to see these slides or get a hold of these slides uh, before them, contact us and we can send it to you as a PDF form so you can look at it. Okay. And then there's another question. This is about your presentation and uh, it deals with the vacuum packing. Are we still looking at a six to 12 month shelf life? Yes, you are. Long? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yes, you are. Uh, you don't want to store too much after 12 months, even though... And that is going in the freezer, by the way. That's going in your freezer. And your freezer is not at... Uh, it's cold, but it's not as cold as some of the uh, freezing units that you see for deep uh, cold storage that commercial folks have, which are pretty darn cold. And in 12 months is a pretty long time. You don't want stuff sitting in that freezer more than 12 months. If you're probably just taking the fish and wrapping it up and put it in the freezer six months, if you're probably doing it by vacuum packing 12 months. 12 months always gives you better shell, uh, uh, freezer storage life and better product when you get done with it. Well, thank you everybody for the questions. If you have any more during this presentation, uh, or think of something, put it in the chat box. We're monitoring that. So I'll turn it back over. Okay, we're, we're going to our last presentation of the day. And I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. He's going to talk somewhat about marketing. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you. You got the uh, screen for, t for the rest of the uh, time. Jonathan, you need to unmute yeah. yourself. I got it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Morning, everyone. Uh, happy to be here to present. I hope everyone can see my screen okay. So I'm here to talk about marketing.
marketing and sales of aquaculture products. So I'll get right to it. Really what I want to talk to you about today is two main topics. The first is adapting to changing markets, which I think is critical right now in the time of COVID-19. Uh, and then talk a little bit about strategic marketing and the kinds of things that you would have to think through and the activities that you'd want to do to be able to develop a strategic marketing plan. So the first thing <clears throat> is that things never stay the same, right? We're always evolving. Things are always changing. Um, you know, we're always, uh, everything's moving forward and, and new technology and, and all kinds of things. So it's just a fact, right? Things never stay the same. So then can your business stay the same and survive? And this is obviously a rhetorical question. Um, the answer is no, but you know, I, I'm, going to share with you now, um, you know, what I've learned from watching and working with many individuals in aquaculture production um, and that have been successful. And, you know, one of the things that they do is, is that they do make small incremental changes to their business every year, uh, both to their business and then also their marketing. So that's something important to think about uh, when you're working through your marketing plan. Obviously, consumer demands change. Uh, we saw that now with COVID, right? When everyone was at home, we saw that the demand for certain products skyrocketed, the demand for other products vanished overnight almost. Um, and so, but even without a pandemic, right? Consumer demands evolve over time. Uh, consumers get more educated about certain products and their preferences shift. So these are just a few examples from history. Uh, you know, there was a time when catfish was really only eaten along the Mississippi River, and that's clearly no longer the case. And, you know, another example is where Orange Ruffy was called Slimehead. Well, the marketing folks got a hold of that one clearly because you don't see Slimehead listed on the menu anywhere. Um, and there was also a time when shrimp was a, a very uh, high-end luxury product with very, very low volumes consumed. And we know that that's not the case anymore either. Shrimp is, uh, is the... Uh, the largest uh, consumed product now uh, that gets imported to the U.S. So, you know, that just is some evidence of over time how things have changed. But when we look at what's happening with consumer demand now, um, we see that consumers are looking for highly differentiated individualized flavors and products, right? And I, I, I like going to the supermarket and walking down the detergent aisle because it's just confusing. There's so many different kinds of detergent now, you know, like looking at the Tide Pods, for example, in this picture, right? There's so many different smells and all kinds of combinations and with downy and without downy and specialized for sports and all kinds of things, right? So you see these very highly individualized products and we see the same when we look at the beverage industry, right? Coca-Cola as a company produces countless different forms of beverages that sell around the world catering to all different kinds of tastes. Um, and so that's, that's the trend that we see in general. Um, so we also see this demand for local food, right, is very strong. And I think that's a unique advantage that aquaculture producers have that they can capitalize on. Um, you know, people want to know the story behind their food. They want to know where their food comes from. And so these are just some logos of different movements or different groups that are out there uh, right now in the U.S. that are promoting local food consumption. Uh, and we do have our own Virginia Grown, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, but again, that's a very strong story to tell, is that local story. And consumers really do want to know the, the story behind their food. More on changing consumer demands. Um, you know, Millennials are now a huge portion of uh, the buying public, right? They now have, they're now older, they have uh, more money to spend. So they're uh, a considerable portion of, of what's happening in the economy. Uh, and they tend to trend towards quality. They tend to trend towards looking for good taste, knowing a product is safe, looking at things like sustainability, responsibility. So if you have uh, a story to tell that fits these criteria, uh, you can target this, this group uh, with your products. Um, and, and maybe you can 
alter your story to target this group, right? Because you know what their preferences are. So that's just something to consider. Now, looking at the business climate, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about COVID here. I don't wanna get too hung up on it, but um, you know, when we look at the business climate, that's also always evolving, right? So we have things like competition with imports that we need to take into account. We have regulatory requirements that we need to take into account. And then there's also uh, the economic growth, the general economic growth. As most of you are probably aware, seafood consumption in the US is primarily something that happens outside of the home. Uh, to the tune of about 70% of seafood is consumed or purchased outside of the home, um, which very closely links it to economic growth. People tend not to eat out at restaurants when times are tough. Um, now with COVID and the closures of the restaurant industry and everyone doing the social distancing and, and isolation, uh, clearly the restaurants were not open for a long time, which has hurt the aquaculture and seafood industry. Um, but this is something to think about, right? When you're developing your marketing plan so that you can be resilient. You know, if you target different sectors, if you come up with a direct to consumer model, for example, or you have a, you know, a storefront or pick up at the farm, uh, you know, other alternatives that helps to make you more resilient to some of these outside pressures, uh, that you don't have control over. So that's just something to consider as well in terms of thinking about how to sell your product and how to market that product um, and target you know, people based. What you wanna do is provide a product that meets the needs of your consumers. And so right now the needs in this time are very different because of COVID. People wanna know the product is safe, they wanna know it's being handled safely, but they also wanna be able to access that product in a safe manner. So that's something to consider as part of your marketing plan right now and for the future. It's important to evaluate what the external threats and opportunities are. These are gonna be specific to your business and your location. Um, so I can't speak to them specifically right now, but it's important to do this evaluation for yourself. And some examples are just, you know, water availability, how much water do you have available to grow product? Uh, what do you do with wastewater or are there any kind of regulations you need to keep in mind in terms of wastewater, uh, labor, uh, predation, and urban encroachment. So these are just a few examples, but you know, really you need to do this kind of an assessment uh, for your individual business. And to update that, I'd say at least annually, to think about what some of those opportunities and threats are for, the, for your particular farm or business. So some of the common pitfalls that we've seen, um, you know, very, very common mistakes that people think uh, make or, or things people tend to overlook. Um, not adapting to changing consumer demands and preferences. That's the biggest mistake. Um, you know, the, if you're not adapting and responding to what consumers want, then people are not gonna buy your product. Um, confusing a hobby with a business. Um, you know, we love fish, I love fish. But clearly, if this is run as a business, it needs to be profitable. Um, not accounting for market risk, right? So that's getting back to that, that point I made earlier about, um, you know, now at a time like, like the pandemic, with all the restaurants closed, if 100% of your sales went to restaurants, that was a huge market risk. Because when the restaurants closed, you have no avenue for sales. So you need to account for market risk in your plan and come up with, alternative options or diversification options that you have available so that you can adapt under a situation like what we're experiencing now. Um, having adequate capital is important, uh, both from an investment standpoint, but also for cash flow, making sure that you have money on hand to continue your operations and to make adjustments as needed uh, so that you can respond to what's happening in the market and consumer demands. The biggest key to avoiding pitfalls that I can give you is that there is no silver bullet. There's no magic answer. Um, it does take small adjustments every year and small changes do add up. I'm glad that Brian mentioned in his presentation earlier that it's critical to have a business plan. I'm gonna repeat that point. Um, you know, it is extremely important. There is no substitute for, for it. Uh, you just have to have a business plan. There's no getting around the need to spend time every year. 
looking at your business, evaluating it, planning and, and doing an ongoing financial analysis. Um, and there are some things out there to help you with this. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this just because the slides will be available and these links will be available, but you can reach out to BCE uh, and there is the Small Business Development Councils throughout Virginia that help with business planning. Um, so there's, there's multiple resources out there available to help you with this. So let's talk a little bit about strategic marketing. So again, each business is unique. Um, every business has a different financial position, a different labor force, different strengths and weaknesses. And to build a profitable business, uh, it's really putting this puzzle together. And these decisions, of course, are linked, right? They're all hinged together. So it's about making market decisions, financial decisions, management, personnel, scope and scale, and then production decisions ultimately. And that's what it takes to make a profitable business. So there really is no easy answer. Um, you have to go through each of these elements and, and, and really consider them carefully in terms of what your strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities are to maximize those. So again, it's important to have a unique plan for your business. This is just some visual examples of some unique business plans that do work. For example, a flower truck. Right? Instead of having a, a flower store, let the flowers go to the customers. Here's one that I personally like quite a bit. Uh, unassembled snowmen for sale, cheap, can look like this. Um, right, That's a business. I mean, that could be a business. I mean, we laugh. But, um, and then rentachicken.com, which is a legitimate business if you would like to look it up. Um, so again, you know, these, these are obviously kind of funny, but um, they are unique plans, and they clearly work because these are existing uh, businesses. <laughs> so preparing a strategic marketing plan, what goes into that? Well, you start with your business goals and your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. Then you have to define what you are really selling. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Uh, but this is really critical, is understanding exactly what it is that you are selling. Then you need to identify by who is your target customer? Who are the person that you are trying to reach? And then develop your marketing strategy based on that previous information. And last but not least, collect feedback. Get some feedback from your customers, revise your production and your financial plan, make those adjustments so that you can continue to evolve and adapt your business to meet the needs and the expectations of your customers. So defining what you're really selling is critically important. Uh, when I put this picture up, I mean, everyone sees this picture and the first thought I know is aquaponics. That's right. But the question is, what is this person selling? Are they selling aquaponics? Are they selling strawberries? Are they selling fish? Are they selling ornamentals? Are they selling organic food? Are they selling the concept of environmental sustainability? Or are they selling something completely different? And the answer to this is, of course, going to be informed by their marketing strategy. It depends on which target audience they're trying to reach, how they're going to market this product, and whether they're just going to be selling strawberries or selling ornamental fish, or whether they're going to be selling a message of environmental sustainability. So it's critically important that you define what it is that you are selling to, to the person that you are trying to sell it to. Again, a very common pitfall in marketing is assuming that you can sell everything that you produce. For most species, you will produce more than you can sell. So please do keep that in mind. Don't make an assumption that you'll sell everything that you grow because the reality is that you likely won't. Identifying that target market. So this is answering the questions of, who wants what your business can uniquely provide? Where are those people who want that? And how many people are there? If it's just a handful of people, you may want to consider a different target market. Um, then the questions that become important are, how much of your product will they buy? Is this going to be a seasonal product? Is this something they're going to buy on occasion, maybe on a weekend? Or is this something they're going to come back and buy regularly? And then, Last but certainly not least, 
what price will they pay? That's a very important question. And I'll talk a little bit more about pricing in just a minute. So the question you want to answer is, why should someone buy your product? Is it the freshness? Is it the quality? Is it because it's locally grown? Or is it simply because you provide the absolute best customer service? You remember everybody's name and birthday. You send them thank you cards. And you're just a very pleasant experience every time they walk into your shop or show up at your farm. Um, and, and I know people that have made an entire business off of their level of customer service. They just provide the absolute best service that they can and it gets them repeat customers. Finding these key markets, again, consider some of the demographic changes that are out there, right? Consider some of the, the trends towards the younger generations being foodies, liking to experiment with food, looking at an emphasis on quality, the local movement again, that very strong local movement, uh, safe food and slow food concepts. These are all things that I think we can take advantage of in aquaculture um, to, to help us out as businesses. So how do you find your key markets? Well, the first thing is visit similar businesses. Look at what other folks are doing. Uh, the second thing is really to observe. All right, observe what people do. When you go to the grocery store and you watch people at the seafood counter, observe their thinking process, observe what they're looking at, what are they looking for, and, and, and take a lesson from that. That can help, to help you to identify certain things that are gaps in the market that people are looking for and maybe not finding, or things that people are buying in large amounts because they really like that, they have a clear preference for that product or that product form. And last but not least, ask. Collect some feedback from your customers. You can use online surveys or you know, uh, even text message surveys nowadays, uh, but you can also just ask them when they're there, when you're interacting with them, ask them if they have any suggestions or ask them if there's a particular product that, they, you know, that they'd like to try or something new that they're looking for that they're not finding anywhere. Um, so I mentioned price early, earlier on. And clearly, your price has to cover your costs, right? Um, that's just, I mean, that's a pretty straightforward fact. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself the question is, can you compete with an imported product on price? For example, imported fish. And the answer is, well, if not, then who's willing to pay a higher price for your product? And for how long are they willing to pay that price? And at what volume? So again, that gets back to targeting your market if you have a niche market that you can target, which is usually willing to pay a higher price, then that may be where you want to put your effort at targeting that niche market, rather than trying to compete on a commodities level with imports. Now, this is very important to think about, is that your price should match the value offer. So your target market and the projected image of your product is important. Segments of your target market is the segment of customers that you've selected because your business can meet their needs, right? And the projected images, that unique, specific marketing mix that your business develops. And that's the value offer. That's people understanding when I buy this product from this farm or this producer, I'm getting this value. And, and that's critically important. Because if your price aligns with that value offer, you'll be successful. But if people have the feeling that your price does not align with the value offer, they're likely not to buy your product. Now there's a whole bunch of other things to think about and quite simply, I don't have the time to get into all of it. But some of the other things you do need to consider as part of your marketing plan are things like distribution, right? How are you gonna get the product to the market? Are people gonna to come to you? Are you gonna to go to a farmer's market? Are you gonna set up a storefront? Are you gonna set up a roadside stand? How exactly are you gonna do that? Um, grading, do you need to do any grading of your product? Uh, and then of course, if you are gonna be shipping product, you, know, you need to consider things like packaging and shipping. How long does the product stay good in shipping? What kind of boxes do you need to use? Um, and then last but not least, communicating with your customers. Again, collecting feedback from your customers is critically important 
to both understanding whether you're meeting their needs or whether there's something else you can be looking at or developing a new product that better meets their needs um, and, and addressing those changing consumer preferences. So there's a host of ways to do that, whether it's through email, uh, social media, um, again, in person, just ask them when they show up at your business. Um, but there's many, many different options there. And I encourage everyone to, to think about a little bit about getting that feedback because it can be critically important. Grow what your customers want to buy. That sounds really easy, right? Um, but it, it's important to identify the specific products that will best meet those needs of your customers in those key markets. And when I say that, I mean things like, is there a specific size of product, right? When do customers want to be able to have this product? Do they want to be able to call you today and pick it up tomorrow? Or are they going to order it far ahead of time? What form do they want it in? Do they want to buy the product live? Do they want it delayed? Do they want some kind of value added? And do they want variety? Well, if they want variety, how much variety? You know, should you be providing a product that has multiple different flavors associated with it? Or can you just target one flavor? Last but not least, before I change to the last slide, uh, it's also important to ask yourself, how many products can you manage efficiently in your business? It's one thing to realize that customers want all this different variety and, and highly individualized products, but you do also need to consider how you as a business are going to manage that and whether you have the capability to manage five different products, 10 different products, or 15 different products, or even more. Um, we're not all Coca-Cola, <laughs> so you know that's important to consider uh, from a management standpoint. Again, getting back to this idea of a business plan, um, your marketing plan is really there to inform your business plan, right? And you need to develop this marketing plan and strategy and then use that to feed into your bigger business plan so that you can be successful. And it's critically important, like I said, to reevaluate this plan on an annual basis and make these small incremental changes over time because the small improvements really do add up and that's the last thing I wanted to say um, and thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that, that there may be